All right, everybody. Welcome to Real Progressives. My name is Steve Grumbine. Today, going to be a fun show. Um, I've been kind of watching from afar our next candidate, our next guest, our next uh, activist. This gentleman is a right, millennial from uh, the great state of Florida, but I see him all over the country. Every time there is something going on, I see this young man showing up representing He's from Young Progressives of America. Let me bring, without further ado, my friend Carlos Jesus. Welcome onto the show, sir. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So when I first met you, it was actually at Occupy Inauguration there at Malcolm X Park in Washington, D.C. Uh, you were there. Tim Canova was there. Many of us that were fighting um, you know, against not only the uh, inauguration of Donald Trump, but also trying to take the progressive movement to the next level in, mm -hmm. in, in a situation where we've got the pro Hillary crowd that uh, obviously was not supporting what we were fighting for. And, and, and then there was this extra group, this group of people that were fighting for what we considered to be a progressive agenda. And there you were. What brought you to Occupy Inauguration? Well, that's actually a, a very interesting, um, starting a, a very historic moment that we were living in, and I was very happy to meet you, uh, Steve. So, pretty much, you know, to to go back to how I got involved in in politics and how I ended up that day, uh, you'd go, you would have to go back to 2016 when I got involved uh, with Bernie Sanders' campaign, and it was it was an incredible moment seeing so many people across this country, you know, demanding some real change and having this candidate who was, you know, speaking the truth uh, and speaking what all of us believe in and seeing so many young people as well getting involved was truly inspiring. And what really uh, motivated me to, to get involved is that there's actually a, a chance here at, at real change. Now, when we look at, uh, you know, after uh, Bernie's campaign, I became a field organizer for Tim Canova for Congress in his race against Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I used to live in, uh, when I was in Florida, and that was an incredible race. You know, Tim did incredibly well against one of the most powerful politicians in D.C. And at that moment, was the chairwoman of the Democratic Party and was involved in being so biased against Bernie Sanders in, in the primary. So that was a huge race. You know, I learned so much uh, while I was campaigning for Bernie, spoke to tens of thousands of, of people across this country and really got to understand the issues that the American people care about. And, you know, after that, Right after Tim's campaign, actually, I went to college at LIU Brooklyn. And I don't know if you, you've heard much about the lockout, but right from campaigning uh, for Tim, uh, a couple of days later, I fly out here to New York to go to college. And on my first day of school, there's the first lockout in American history of college professors at, at a university. And what happened was that the union was being attacked by the uh, school administration in an attempt to force a contract down their throats and not have a proper negotiating uh, sessions with, with the professors. You know, this was a terrible contract. It, it cut adjunct pay, uh, professor pay. It was really bad. And imagine my first day of college after campaigning for a whole year, having professors outside physically locked out, not being able to go in. You have random people just filling in the classes or no one. And I decided to take action. I organized, I went out, protested uh, with a professor, skipped class because honestly, my professors were outside and organized the students that were outside to demand that the lockout end and have our professors back and fair wages for them. And it was a week and a half long resistance of the first week and a half of school. Uh, and we organized sit-ins, walkouts, occupations, marches, and we defeated the lockout. We had hundreds and hundreds of students each day. And, you know, that was a major victory. We defeated the lockout and we were able to get our professors back and show the whole country that you can't do that. You can't lock out professors because students will rise up. And I, I believe it's the reason why there hasn't been a lockout since, since this was the first time, because we actually sided with the professors. And, you know, obviously uh, I was very involved in that time. Then Trump becomes president. And I realize young people need to step it up. And, you know, one of the, the, the big events was, you know, our inauguration day. And, you know, that's when I just I got a I got a call uh, from the organizers. They invited me to speak. 
and you know, I made my way down to DC. I said, you know, this is this is a very dangerous moment in in our country, in our democracy, when we have someone like Trump being elected. And not only do I have to be there, and other young people have to be there, but we have to fight for a progressive vision, an alternate vision of America. And that's that's what I, you know, my message when I made that speech at Occupy Inauguration uh, was that you know we we must have hope that we can fight for better things. But we need to fight not just against Trump. We need to offer an alternative to the current system. That is just an amazing, amazing story. Because, you know, most people, I mean, with all due respect, just to kind of level set, how old are you right now? I'm 20 years old. This is amazing. Most people when they're that age are not thinking globally like that. They're not thinking big picture like that. They're not that committed to making change here you are from a very early age out there rallying, organizing, building uh, political power, if you will, building a voice for yourself and mm-hmm. for your cause and for the movement. I want to commend you for that. I think that's extremely rare, unfortunately. But you seem to be adamant about making that less rare. What, what are some of the mm-hmm. things you're doing today that directly help organize young people? Why are young people drawn to the message of your organization and quite frankly to your work? Well, look, the reality is that I actually have a lot of hope in our generation. Uh, you know, when, when I have conversations with so many young people, the, when it, during the election, uh, so many people were like, I wish Bernie was, you know, was president. You know, I remember was was in the general election. Like, young people are the most progressive generation in America currently, the most diverse generation and right now we'll be, we are the, vote, the largest voting bloc for this midterm starting um, in November. Now, the, the goal of our organization is to empower young people to collectively wield political power in order to create progressive change. Our goal is to, is to have young people realize that we do have the power and provide that avenue of how do we make that change possible. And the way we see it is that it's taking political power through the electoral system and outside to direct action, through organizing on issue campaigns. Also supporting young people running for office and informing, educating young people. Because at the end of the day, a lot of young people want to make change that they just don't know how. And this is the avenue to do it. And one thing that's very appealing as well to young people to join organizations, like we've been to college campuses um, and, and, you know, had meetings and recruitment, and we're actually in the process of forming, forming a lot of chapters in different colleges, especially in the New York area, but also across the country, is that we're youth-led. That's a very big one. Uh, you know, when, when we look at other organizations, which are amazing and we support, but there's, there's, there's a lack of, you know, voice for young people, and that's something that we provide. We're youth-led with the goal of empowering young people, and we realize that time's running out. Right now, we need young people to step it up, and we need to transform a society because, you know, climate change right now is, is going to be devastating. It's already showing signs of how dangerous it could be if we don't uh, get that under control. We have record levels of wealth and income inequality that are, that are a complete threat to our democracy. Uh, poverty levels that we've never seen before. We have huge uh, issues with our criminal justice system and, and racial injustices. And our generation is not shackled by the ideologies, ideologies and prejudice of the past and are unafraid to dream big of a better society. And I think we're at a pivotal moment in history, to be completely honest. And that is what's really appealing to young people uh, to joining our organization and our cause. That's fantastic. So one of the things that you know I feel is very important, uh, the Levy Institute, uh, led by Pavlina Cherneva and uh, I think Stephanie Kelton was involved, Marshall Auerbach and others, put out a really, really groundbreaking report, uh, I guess it was about a month ago, talking about how the single greatest thing that could happen to our economy would be to get rid of student loans. Student loans are something that there's no young person or old person, no person in general should be carrying the weight of a student loan for educating. It's an investment in our society. It's an investment in our kids. It's an investment in our entire, mm-hmm. the, the well-being of our planet. Is that a an area that you feel millennials would get behind is getting rid of student debt and also free college? Yes, these are one of the issues that we're, we feel very strongly about and we're advocating for. You know, student debt um, is 
one of the biggest debts that our country holds. I believe it's $1.4 trillion in student debt. You know, that is a huge punishment for people to just try to get an education. And, you know, there's a lot of questions around, well, can we do it? Well, the reality is that we just gave a tax break to the top 1% of $1.5 trillion, which exploded the deficit and the debt. And it doesn't matter why, because there is money there. We can't do it as a nation. The issue is there's no political will to do that. And yeah. the Republican Party Let me say absolutely do not care. You, you, what you've just said is so important because I'm not worried about the deficit. The deficit is a non, non-issue. It's, it's a political mm-hmm. tool that they use to try to keep us down. It, it's a joke. We exactly. create our own money. So when you say that, you're exactly right. It is a political decision that they're using to continue to exacerbate the wealth gap and put the pain and suffering of private debt on the shoulders of students. It's absolutely inconscionable that these folks do this. What what is some of the feedback you get from students as they look at, you know, hey man, I'm getting ready to go into society. There's no jobs out there. We're sitting here getting ready to carry this major debt. I mean, are they angry? What is the voices of the youth saying right now? Absolutely. Every young person I talk about wants to get rid of student debt. And that's something that we're currently working on uh, to make sure that we can have a very uh, a very good proposal. But the reality is there's a lot of candidates running. And something that, that you know, candidates, when they, they talk about wanting to be endorsed by us, we mentioned that uh, we need you to take a stance on eliminating, abolishing student debt. You know, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't. If you look at also in the 2008, when the bankers, um, uh, Wall Street executives who ruined the economy, crashed it and got away with it and ruined the lives of millions of people, yet they got away free and got bailed out. So if we could bail out these honestly criminal uh, Wall Street uh, bankers, then why can't we bail out the young people? Of America. Amen. How can we not bail out the future of our country, giving them proper access to education and not punishing them with debt that you can't buy a house, you can't buy a car, you can't even advance? There's been many studies that have shown that if we eliminate student debt, that would actually unleash an incredible amount of spending power that would help the economy incredibly. Amen. Now, I mean, that is beautifully stated. I'm right there with you. So let, let me ask you obviously, over the last uh, 24 hours, some major stuff has happened internationally. The Trump administration did what the Obama administration did, which the Bush administration did, which is they bombed another sovereign nation. We mm. bombed Syria. You know, I'm, I'm obviously skeptical of the rationale. We've seen this story play out so many times. What is the feeling of the youth, the millennial movement, young progressives of America? What is the feeling about war? What is the stance on war? And how do they view these acts of aggression? Look, I think young people are actually pretty, um, from my experience, are very uh, against war, 100%. You know, there's absolutely no need for us to go to another country and bomb them, ruin the lives of other people, when we in our own country are not spending money to help our own poor people. You know, it is incredibly and absolutely unjust how the military industrial complex in our country has been driving foreign policy. And, and, and in all honesty, war has become a money-making game, you know, and we have these war hawks right now who are constantly on the forefront of wanting to do for regime change and interventions, which creates such horrible suffering. And I think young people are united in this. We don't need to cause that suffering to other countries and to other people especially in the way that we do it in America, when we have, we are the most powerful military in the world, but instead of actually using the resources that we have to encourage and create a a better world, what we're doing is that we're trying to maintain power and keep uh, countries in check in ways that are authoritarian and unconstitutional. I believe that Trump's attack of not even asking Congress are uh, having it approved by Congress in these attacks are actually violate international law and on a sovereign nation. And the reality is that, you know, chemical attacks are horrible and we should not let that happen. But there hasn't even been an independent study yet to come out so that we can see who actually was behind it. 
the drums of war are always on uh, are always beating. And when we see both, you know, people in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, we're always pro uh, intervention without, you know, you ask questions later. I think we've we need to learn the lessons from Iraq. That does not help. That hurts our country. That actually creates more terrorism if we keep invading other countries, create instability. Also, more refugees are going to are going to be out in the world without being being able to be safe in their homes. And we as Americans and as young people, we have a special duty because we're in America. You know, we can actually affect the decisions that are made in, a, in our country that, that affect other people. So I think that young people are united in this. We're against war. We should not be spending so much money on uh, bombs, on weapons. I believe the, you know, the attacks that we're going to be raging right now in Syria will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Yet we can't get water in Flint. Yet we can't um, provide health care for all Americans. So there's always money there, but for war, because the military industrial complex has so much control over our politics and that has to end. And that starts with getting money out of politics. I couldn't agree with you more. I want to talk about this. I want to dig a little deeper on this subject in particular. Mm -hmm. One of the things that this organization, my organization, Real Progressives, does is we talk about economics. I don't want to get too deep into it because we haven't had an opportunity to, to prep this out. But at a high level, it's encouraging on one level to see, hey, you know, you saw tax cuts occur to the wealthy. And at the same time, you saw a massive bump in the military's budget and not one ounce of tax being raised. Why is that? Well, it's because we create the money. And because we create the money, when we create these false scarcities on Medicare for all, when we create a false scarcity on providing college, when we create a false scarcity on feeding the poor, mm. taking care of Flint, taking care of Puerto Rico, taking care of all these things that are real right here, right now in our face, you know, it tells you automatically that we're not just dealing with, hey, we're, the country's broke. The country's not broke. We're dealing yeah. with a nation that has chosen to make the people suffer while it fattens the wallets of the 1%. From Wall Street financialization of our existence, student loans, to all the other things like, for example, green energy. Why mm -hmm. in the world are we fighting for oil when we've got untapped potential right <laughs> above our heads in the clouds? We got hydroelectric. We've got wind power. We've got a ton of things that would offset our need for digging out old fossil fuels from the ocean, from the Arctic, wherever. Why in the world would we be like this? It doesn't make sense to me. It's it's nefarious as hell. And I imagine that young people would like to have clean water. They would like to have a country with beautiful landscapes, not completely raised by mining and destroying our, our environment. What are some of the thoughts from your group in terms of the environmental impacts? And, and where are the stances from the young people how do they see these sorts of things? Well, look, I, as a young person, I'm very worried for the future of our planet, for the future of our society. We're seeing an incredible stratification of, uh, of our country here in America. Uh, we're seeing, you know, increased tensions across the world. We're seeing authoritarianism on the rise, rising seawaters. You know, we're seeing storms that are more powerful each day due to our global warming. So I'm very worried. I want to have a world where I can live in. I want, and other young people as well, not only for our lifetime, but for future generations. And when, you know, history looks back at this time, I want to say that we fought, that we created that better world, and we were able to make sure that other generations are able to have a society and a planet that is worth living in. Now, when it comes to, you know, how nefarious our economic system is, the reality is it's by design. You know, the the rules and the laws and, you know, the current way the state operates is to protect, you know, the land owning wealthy elites. That's that's the you know, one of the main purposes. If we if you go back to even um, when our country was was founded in the Constitution, uh, it was to protect the minority and not necessarily not minority as we look at it today, but actually the wealthy minority, a land owning minority. Now, our job is to, yes, be angry. Yes, criticize, but take action because the powerful will not give you what you want. The reality is in order to create political change in a society like this, where right now the state operates as a weapon of the wealthy to make sure that, you know, the wealthy will maintain their uh, their land and their wealth is that we need to turn out and vote. We need 
to create mass movements on the streets as well as through the electoral system and take political power. And that takes the left uniting. That takes people on the left realizing that we have a lot more in common than we have different. That is something that the right has been able to do very well and the left hasn't. And if we're able to channel the, the energy that young people have with already existing institutions to take that political power and create the change in the economic system so that it's not an economy that is only supposed to benefit those in power, but actually distributes the wealth in a way where everyone can have uh, a decent living, then that takes, that takes elections, that takes campaigning, that takes supporting young people. To be completely honest, young people, we are willing to do this. Uh, we have the energy. We do need the support. You know, we, most of us, you know, have a lot of college debt. Most of us are in college. You know, a lot of us, uh, you know, young people were victims of the this economic system. So we do need support from the old generations in order to make this, this possible. But what I have to say is that there's no free, free sandwich in politics. You go out and you campaign and you take power. You win the election. You do better than the other side. And then you implement the policies, which is what Democrats, have, when they get in power, need to do. Once they get in power, you implement a progressive agenda. You don't compromise with the Republicans. Obama tried to do that, and the Republicans hated him anyways and blocked them in every single way. So I think that's something that we need to learn. That right now we can't compromise with a party that is unabashedly racist and is completely for a war against poor people. So I think my message is that we need to vote out Wall Street Democrats. Um, now, I, our organization is not Democrat. Uh, it's independent progressive organization however we do see the reality that we have to get those uh, democrats who don't represent the ideals of the party out but we also need a mass movement on the outside of the political system and we need independence as well like we were very open uh, to do that but what we need is to work together in a way that we can make sure that we can create the progressive change in a progressive america that we desperately need yes i do i'm telling you right now i'm so impressed with you i i mean this is Everything you're saying literally lines up with the stuff we're saying. I think that there are some things that we can work on offline. Like I would love to talk to you further about economics and be able to provide mm -hmm. the, that kind of help to you guys because we've got access to people, lots and lots of good, solid academic and empirical data to help fuel a progressive agenda. I mean, and I'm mm -hmm. talking about not just in the U.S. because the problems we're facing in the U.S., okay or a microcosm of the global scene, because neoliberalism, which is the real enemy here, is a global scourge and it's being exported, it's our chief export. As an mm -hmm. importing nation, our chief export beyond our military is neoliberalism. And we're spreading mm -hmm. it to the UK where they're trying to privatize their health system. We're spreading it to yeah. Australia where they're trying to privatize their health system. And so yeah, every sure. place we go, we literally leave them worse than they were before. And what I would like to see is a, a movement like what you're saying, a mass movement, and not just of young people, although young people play a key role in this, but I'd like to see everyone. I'd love to see exactly. strollers. I'd like to see elderly on canes. I'd like to see everybody uh, from all walks of life participating in the success of their own lives and the success of this nation. Exactly. So got a really good grasp on what it takes to motivate the youth. What are some of the things that are coming up from your organization that maybe we could get behind and help you all out? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that, that we've, um, you know, realized when it comes to organizing young people is that when the message comes from other young people, it, it motivates people. And it's not saying that, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders was not young and he, he motivated the young people. So I'm not saying that. But, you know, what I am saying is that when when other young people take a step, then it motivates other young people to do it as well. Um, another one is the issues. You know, young people, you know, if you if you were to look to Fox News, they'd tell you that young people are these, you know, these lazy, uh, uninformed people, which is completely false. Young people are very informed and we care a lot about the issues that speak to our hearts. Uh, and we, you know, one thing that's very important, for example, on the economic issue, that's, that's super important. You know, young people care about what it affects them directly and also on the global scale. And one thing that a lot of young people are very angry about is the is the political system. There's a lot of apathy. 
100%. But that's not just young people, that's across the board. And the reason for that is that it's by design. The, the people in power make government not work. Because government could work correctly, but they make it on purpose so that it doesn't work. And then you can privatize, go back in the election, say government doesn't work, we need to privatize, and you put it in the hands of special interests, of individuals, of private interests. And you privatize it instead of having someone where the election can actually uh, you know, decide things, you have instead of CEOs who are deciding your future and in your job and in your political sphere, which is why I agree with you. The struggle is international. Our global economic system exploits countries, it exploits the poor and is unsustainable. It's completely unsustainable. And I actually recently um, you know, was interviewed by a couple of uh, students from the UK, from from uh, a university in Newcastle, and they, when, in my conversations with them, we have so much in common with young people in the UK, in France, in other parts of the of the world, um, the it, you know, different countries from in every single continent. Young people realize there's a need for change, but the the, the goal now is to unite those uh, those forces so that we're able to, to make change. And it's not, like I said, you're right. It's not young people. It's, it's all of us together. Um, but you know, looking at the increasing power that young people have, we need to mobilize it because young people are not turning out to vote due to that apathy. My message to people who are apathetic is that I have experience where you can make change. When you organize protests, it works. The powers that be are afraid when they see people marching down the street, when they see people organizing, when they see people speaking truth to power. The, the people in power are very afraid of that and will concede. And as a matter of fact, my goal is for them not to concede. My goal is for us to win and take that power away from them. The way that they're handling it is only for their own benefit. So, you know, the issues that we care about, like I said, it's the environment. We care about the economy. We care about racial justice as well. We, we have seen how we have a policing system that is so grossly uh, prejudiced against people of color. And we see it over and over in these police killings. And this has to stop. So we, we understand that we, we really deeply understand how much of our generation is affected by that. Uh, you know, on the other issues as well. And, and this is why income inequality and campaign finance are so connected, because the reason we can get common sense things like gun, like like for example, the issue with uh, gun reform. Why can we get that? Because you have powerful lobbies; they're able to block it with money. Why can we get common sense economic policies? Because you have Wall Street, you have the financial sector. That's right. So the issue is that economic inequality directly translates into political inequality. You cannot have an equal society when you have some people with more wealth than the other. That's so that's that. where we have to really attack as well. So, right, so I want to talk about policing for a moment and, and mm -hmm. the, the horrific conditions that minorities are under, especially in impoverished areas. Yeah. So one of the things that we advocate for is a federal job guarantee. Mm -hmm. Federal job guarantee, federally funded, locally administered, allows care work and it ends the lock, that, that horrible situation of generational poverty where people don't have access to resources by giving them a living wage with living benefits, et cetera. They could go anywhere in the country. They could leave at any time and go wherever they need to be mm -hmm. instead of being trapped in bad situations, both domestic situations and just, you know, like mm -hmm. up in Flint, wouldn't it be great if those people could say, you know what, we're leaving. You, you guys want to take care of us? Maybe we'll come back, but we're going wherever we're going to be taken care of. And you look at the wealth gap, and the reason why so much of this is the way it is is in the early 70s, they went ahead and cut the spigot off on federal spending. And mm -hmm. what they did was they said, you guys go out there and take on private debt to fill the, the voids when these downturns, you guys go in debt. You, the regular people who can't print your own money, who can't create your own resources, you go in debt. And when the economy rises again, then you pay that debt off. And that has been going on since the 1970s with Milton mm -hmm. Friedman, uh, Paul Volcker, yeah. that whole movement. And we're still dealing, and that is the source of neoliberalism. And it cascaded into steroids under Reagan, and it even got worse under Clinton. And we have never, ever turned that down. I think that it's very important for people to understand what neoliberalism is, not just a derogatory term. It's a real yeah. thing. Understand what it is. 
Understand why we are all impacted. All of us are impacted because we watch sitcoms. Even Roseanne the other day, she's sitting there bad mouthing her sister because her crazy idea of being able to have health care for all, how are you going to pay for it? Another typical neoliberal question mm -hmm. that is simplified by Congress will authorize the funds. It's that simple. And, and they literally make us all scared to death of these things. And it allows the wealthy to keep making money on our misery because then all of a sudden you have payday lenders. You've got all this predatory lending, predatory investments, yeah. predatory, predatory, predatory that eats us all alive. What I would like to know from your standpoint is do you have a, do you have enough power, if you will, within your organization to get folks to come out, stand up and say, we've had enough. Do you have that kind of, uh, grassroots network, or do you need help building it? What can we do to help you overthrow this thing? Because that is mm -hmm. our single point of purpose is to crush neoliberalism, bring about a new deal yesterday, a green new deal mm -hmm. that, and, and, and address like literally every single point you've made. We are, I mean, like lockstep brother. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me. Do you, do, what do you've got there? What can we do to help man? So look, we're actually, very rapidly growing organization, you know, started uh, last year uh, around the time of Occupy inauguration, actually. And it's been growing ever since, you know, it, it, the reality is that, you know, we have the message, you know, we have the message, we have the goal and the vision. What we do need, you know, support is in spreading that message, you know, online is, you know, there's an incredibly powerful tool. And one thing that we need is to reach more young people, you know, get those resources in order for us to be able to uh, reach out to more young people in order to operate even even better. We're growing, we're building, as we're saying, a huge movement. Uh, we've, we've shown what we can do. We actually had a big rally outside of Chuck Schumer's office uh, back in February, demanding that he take uh, a stand for dreamers and not, you know, not cave to Republicans. And we, you know, we had a letter, we are, we, we were able to read that letter. We gave it to the, you know, his office, and we demanded that he, that the Democratic, the congressional Democrats, take a stand on on DACA and protect these dreamers. Uh, we've we've also, you know, organized we organized a fundraiser recently. Uh, we've been in elections as well, student government elections, uh, both you know last year, and we're focusing one here. As a matter of fact, I want to kind of announce that I intend to run for student government president at LIU Brooklyn. Uh, you know, and we're going to really fight for a real. You know, progressive agenda on campus. You know, neoliberalism. You can see the effects everywhere. Here in our campus, for example, they're selling off our campus to private corporations, different pieces. And you know, that is the microcosm. You know, of of what it happens in the country. Now, I want to say that we're not just college campuses. You know, we have young people from across. You know, the the spectrum from high school to thirty five really is our age. But like I said, we welcome the support of everyone. I mean, we have a. You know, we're building a good volunteer distributive system. Uh, where we can support that cause and take it nationally uh, from across. So already we have you know, we have members from different parts of the country, but we're growing. And if people can listen to our message and support us, then you know the, the future is going to be ours. I think that we're going to create a better world. I truly believe that we are at a pivotal moment. People are aware of the issues. They are tired. One thing I want to say on neoliberalism really quick is that there's this ideology that we need to fight back. The ideology that was created you know, through neoliberalism is that and it even stems even further from the conservative ideology where society just works as a way to bind and create rules, but everyone's competing against each other. We're at each other's throats constantly. And that's the economy we live in. And that's the paranoia of this ideology that we need to once and for all destroy. The reality is in our society, we all depend on each other. We're yeah. so, it's a social aspect that we all need to care for each other because we're all interconnected. And when we realize that Someone else's suffering is our suffering. That's actually innate in our human being. We don't want other people to suffer. We make justifications for that, for not to help other people or not support that due to this pervasive ideology that we're all self-interest individuals only fighting for ourselves. The reality is that it's not. We need from each other. We need a society that understands that, that we, we have much to gain from working together. Someone else's suffering will be ours. And we have to understand that if we make sure that a child in another part of the country is able to go to school and is able to have access to water and food, our our little uh, 
part of our country is going to be better. You know, if our tax money goes to that, which like we, we spoke about, the way taxes work aren't how the Republicans have sold it. The reality is we do have enough money because we issue the currency. But the thing is, how do we distribute our resources to make sure that all everyone in America is protected? And the reality is that we do have the resources. That ideology is very dangerous that we all have to care about ourselves now, caring for each other and making sure that we all have resources and we're all able to have a decent life. And, you know, I personally believe that we have fundamental rights that we need to ensure, which is the right to proper shelter, the right to food, the right to education, the right to health care, the right to pr protection, you know, the right from uh, being able to live without being discriminated against. These are fundamental rights that I believe that our country needs to ensure, which don't exist under the Constitution. The American Constitution only ensures individual uh, liberties, which get uh, all the time are violated. They don't ensure any economic or social rights, which is something that we need to push for. But when we look at, uh, you know, the, the way that policing works, and I want to go to that. I think ICE should be abolished immediately. ICE was created in 2003. It is not something that has been really part of, of America for, for any uh, time. And it's really acting as a political uh, arm of these very xenophobic right-wing conservatives that are destroying the lives of millions of people. You know, I personally believe that no human is illegal and we should ensure that all undocumented immigrants have a pathway to citizenship because they've come to this country. I come from an immigrant family and they've come to this country, they've worked really hard and it is completely opposite to the American ideals to attack the immigrant community the way that ICE does it. Also private prisons profit so much from immigrant detention centers which many people um, don't realize is how pervasive this privatization and how really the policies that we have are driven by by private interests. They're driven by, you know, these wealthy people that just aim to make money off incarcerating That's black right. and brown people. That's right. That's neoliberalism on steroids. And so, Carlos, what I want to do, um, we're, we're up against it. I want to thank you for your time. I hope that you'll come back soon. I really want to work with you in the future. I'm so impressed with you. Our audience is really impressed with you as well. And I, I just want to wish you well on all that you do and good luck in your, your uh, campaign that you're running. And um, I hope we can have you on back soon. Thank you so much, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Um, if anyone wants to support our cause, they can go to our website, www.ypamerica.org forward slash join. Um, I'd encourage that uh, to be you know, sent out to any young person that you know. If you want to support us, <coughs> you can also on the top of our website, you can donate um, for, uh, to our, our cause. You know, anything that people can do to support us will mean a lot to us. So, um, like, again, www.ypamerica.org. Um, follow us on, on Instagram at YPA underscore org. The same for Twitter and for Facebook, Young Progressives of America. Fantastic. Thank you. With that, I'm going to say goodbye. Carlos, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it immensely. With that, we'll bid you all adieu, folks. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Steve. You got it. Bye-bye.